Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's special webinar series. Today's topic is advantages and limitations of VLF and TAN delta testing for medium voltage cables. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, your certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Javier Ruiz Leva, Cable Sales Manager. Also to assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Marshall Bird, Regional Sales Manager, and Charles Nybeck, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today, Javier. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for everyone to attending this webinar. Let's uh, start uh, doing a quick review of the agenda for this uh, webinar. We'll start, uh, we will start uh, talking of the basics about uh, medium voltage cables, uh, medium voltage cable construction, the failure mechanisms for medium voltage cables and the lifetime of a cable. Then we will continue talking of cable maintenance, uh, the VLF test, uh, what is the VLF test, uh, the parameters involved in the VLF test, the goals and the standards. And we will finalize uh, talking of the VLF, uh, discussing the advantages and limitations of the VLF test. We will continue talking of the TAN delta test. Uh, we'll define what is the TAN delta test, the parameters, the assessment criteria, and how to interpret the results. And we will finalize this presentation talking of the advantages and limitations of the TAN delta and some important information that we should consider uh, of the TAN delta on new cables. So let's start with the basics about medium voltage cables. The uh, single phase uh, cable that we are seeing right now in this slide is the classical co construction for medium voltage cables in which we have a center conductor that could be of uh, uh, copper of aluminum material. Next, we will have the inner semicon layer then we have the main insulation in this case well in this case of the, in the case of the cable that we are seeing in this slide is a xlpe insulation next we will have the outer semicon layer next we will have the concentric or the metallic shield of the cable and finally we will have the jacket or the shield of the cable Besides the single phase cable that we saw in the previous slide, we can have other constructions. For instance, we can have the three core cable in which we have three conductors, each one with its individual shield or with its uh, individual concentric. And then we will have the belted cable in which we have three conductors with a common shield. So we can have different uh, construction for medium voltage cables, and uh, that will affect how we connect our test equipment to do the VLF test or the TAN delta test. But besides that, uh, what we will see in this presentation will apply for any construction of medium voltage cable if we have a uh, concentric or metallic shield. In terms of the insulation of the cables, we have two types of insulations, the solid dielectric or plastic insulation cables or polymeric insulation. We are seeing in the left the two most common uh, e uh, polymeric insulations, that is the EPR, ethylene propylene rubber, and the XLPE, that is cross-linked polyethylene. And in the right, we have the paper insulated lead covered cable in which we have as of, of insulation, we have paper impregnated in uh, oil, the electric oil. Um, in terms of, of the payload mechanisms for medium voltage cables, we should, we should distinguish between local issues and global issues. The local issues will affect only a small portion of the insulation or um, some uh, accessories in, in my cable. It could be the splices, it could be the terminations, but the local issues will not be spread along all the segment of the cable, okay? And mainly the local issues are related with workmanship issues or manufacturing defects. By the other hand, we have the global issues and the global issues are related with the aging process of the insulation of our cables and they will be spread along all the cable. This is a 
uh, uh, aging condition of the insulation and will affect all the segment of the cable, all the insulation of the cable. In the case of uh, polymeric insulations, in the case of XLPE insulation, uh, the main reason for the aging conditions are the wire trees. And in the case of the X, uh, in the case of the paper insulated cables, the main reason for the uh, aging condition is the cellulose degradation. We will see later that when we have ingress of moisture or water in the uh, paper insulated cable, the, uh, the water and the cellulose, the, the water and the paper are not good partners. So that will start a uh, cellulose degradation when we have ingress of water or moisture in, in, in a paper insulated cable. So depending of what problem we are dealing with, uh, depending if uh, of the issue, we can use different methods. For instance, if we are looking for severe installation or manufacturer defects, we can use the VLF test. If we are looking for incipient uh, installation or manufacturer issues, let's say incipient or small uh, warmanship issues, we can use then the partial discharge. And if we are looking for uh, aging conditions of the insulation, then we use the tan delta. So depending on the problem we are dealing with is the test method we, we, will, we will apply. Uh, in terms of local problems, uh, more or less we all have a good idea what can create uh, uh, local issues or uh, what, what are the most common manufacturer or warmanship issues in our cable. We are seeing in this slide some pictures that show us some of the classic uh, problems that we can have uh, related with warmanship issues or manufacturing defects. Starting from the upper corner in the left, we have a, a, a transmission splice that blew up because it was assembled in the, in the, in the wrong way. Um, in, uh, below, we have a medium voltage splice uh, medium voltage splice that was uh, is a heat shrink splice. And the problem was that when the guy ensemble this splice, he didn't uh, heat uniformly uh, the splice. And so the, uh, the shrink material was not completely contract. And that was the problem. And for that reason, we have this void and this void uh, created uh, problems with partial discharge. In the medium, in the medium of the, uh, uh, um, slide, we have uh, the classic problem of uh, workmanship issues. In this case, the guys, uh, when uh, fix uh, the cables in the holders, exceed the torque and they inflicted uh, the formation in the cable and the deformation decay in the cable uh, sooner or later will create a partial discharges. And the last two pictures are the classic problems with the terminations in the pictures uh, in the upper uh, right corner. We have the classic problem when the, the guys didn't uh, do the cuts in the right way. And for the reason we had that issue. And in the uh, below, we have the classic problem when they ensemble the terminations and they put some contaminants in there. So all these are uh, uh, local issues that will affect a portion of the insulation or some specific uh, splices or terminations, and they are related with warmanship issues or manufacturer defects. To understand the aging process of the cable, uh, we need to understand that today all the medium voltage power, power cables have a high life expectancy. We can say today that the life expectancy of a medium voltage uh, uh, power cable will be around 50 years. Okay, that is a lot, 50 years. But during the world service life, they are subject to thermal, electrical, mechanical, and environmental stresses. And these stresses will change the morphological properties of the insulation. In few words, will age and degrade the insulation material. And result, the result is a decrease of the breakdown strength of the insulation, and decreases of the insulation breakdown strength will finally lead to cable failures. In the case of the XLPE insulation, the main uh, driver, the main reason, or the most important aging phenomenon are the wire trees. And the wire trees are uh, developed develop it in the insulation in the next way. 
All start all starts with the ingress of water uh, by the fish by the fusion or sh or shift faults. Uh, we for that reason it's very important that when we pull the cable, we don't uh, um, put holes holes in the in, in the sheet, okay? Because that will the, the the holes or the perforation in the shield will create uh, or will permit the ingress of water in this foundation of the cable. But so once we have the ingress of water in the insulation, uh, the water together with the electrical stress will start the genera generation and growth of water trees. And a water tree is a uh, chemical degradation of the, uh, the it's, it's a chemical degradation of the insulation, insulation material. So every time that the water tree increases its size, uh, the other part of the insulation, that is the healthy part of the insulation, will be subject to a higher stress field, okay? Because all this uh, wire tree is conductive. So the other part of the, of the insulation that is healthy need to uh, hold all the stress, okay? So every time this uh, wire tree increases its size, we have a higher feel the stress in the other side of the insulation. At, 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 at one point, sooner or later, will be so much the increase, uh, so will be so much the stress in the other side of the insulation that we will start with the partial discharge process. And once we have the partial discharge, we will start with the electrical three. And when we have electrical three, it will be a matter of hours or a couple of days to have uh, a fault because the electrical three is a uh, carbonization of the insulation. Okay, so all is this much or less is the, the 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 process, the complete process of the growth of the wire tree and the the convert in electrical three and the fault. The point is that the time that will take to the wire tree to take to reach its uh, critical size could be years, could be five years, could be 20 years, could be even 30 years, okay? But once we have electrical threes in the insulation of the cable, it will be a matter of hours of days to have a fault, okay? In the, in the case of the paper insulated cables, the, the most important aging phenomenon is the ingress of water. Also, the problem of the ingress of water is do a the problems in the in the lead in the cover lead of the, of the cable and one we have the ingress once we have the ingress of water in the insulation of the paper insulated cable it will start a degradation process of the cellulose so uh, after we uh, know what we saw in the previous slides we can talk of the lifetime of a cable and the lifetime of a cable is pretty much to the chart of a bad tube in which we will start with a high probability of failures. This high probability of failures will be related with warmanship issues or, warm, or manufacturing defects and will, will happen in the first months or weeks uh, that the cable is in service. Uh, that will happen, let's say, in the first third of the lifetime of a cable. In the second third of the lifetime of the cable, we will have unexpected breakdowns related with the uh, operation conditions, okay? But the probability of failure will be uh, uh, lower. And in the last third of the lifetime uh, of a cable, we will start with an increase of the probability of failures, okay? If we want to extend the lifetime of a cable, the only way to achieve that goal is by doing maintenance tests uh, when the cable is in service. In that way, we know uh, or we can say that the maintenance in, or to our cable is not only important to increase the reliability of the cable system, but also to extend the lifetime of a cable. Okay, so. Let's uh, talk of the uh, cable ma maintenance strategy that we can uh, design. And that strategy will start with the commissioning test or, or acceptance test uh, of uh, newly installed cable circuits and will finish or will end with the replacement of uh, the entire cable or section of it. 
But in between, we have to have uh, the periodic maintenance testing of service aged cable circuits. Okay, we need to have that to uh, not only increase the reliability of the cable system, but also to extend the lifetime of our assets. We can start the uh, usually we use the VLF test and the partial discharge test as, as commissioning tests. And uh, for maintenance tests, we can use the VLF, the time delta, and the partial discharge test. And depending on the results is what methods we will use. Okay, but pretty much for uh, a strategy to increase the cable reliability and to extend the cable lifetime, this is pretty much the, 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 the test that we will use in the lifetime of the cable. So let's start with talking about the VLF. What is the VLF? Uh, fundamentally, the VLF is an AC over voltage test. We also call it uh, AC high pot, and we use the frequency of 0 0.1 hertz. And uh, the VLF test is pretty much like a pressure test in which we will apply a voltage that is pres prescribed by the IEEE 400.2, and the goal is that the cable holds the voltage during the test time, okay? If the cable holds the voltage during the test time, we say that the cable is okay and we can energize the cable. If the cable doesn't hold the voltage, then we have a fault. We will have a fault and we need to repair the cable or replace the cable, okay? So the VLF test is a pass-fail test. And it's important to know that we will have a limited diagnostic information, okay? So if we are looking for the aging conditions of the insulation of the cable, or if we are looking for um, warmanship issues in the um, um, splices or terminations, then we need to use the tan delta or the partial discharge test. Okay, so PLF test is only a go-no-go -no -go test. Uh, the most important parameters in the VLF test is the wave shapes. We have, let's say, two official or the most common wave shapes used in the VLF test are the sinus wave shape and the cosine rectangular wave shape. Both uh, wave shapes have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we can say that, for instance, the sinus wave shape, the units are uh, lighter, smaller, and, and cheaper. And also, we can use the sinus wave shape to do the tan delta test. Uh, uh, the big the disadvantage or the disadvantage of the sinus wave shape is that at 0 0.1 hertz, we have a limited test capacitance. By the other hand, the cosine rectangular wave shape, uh, we is of course a uh, heavier units, as, uh, big ones and uh, expensive ones. But the test capacitance that we have at 0 0.1 hertz is, is bigger than in compare if we compare with the sinus wave shape. Okay. Uh, the test voltage that we will apply is between two times U0 and three times U0, where U0 is the rated RMS face to ground voltage of the cable. And the, 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 the test time, the time is uh, between 30 and 60 minutes. Uh, in, 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 this, in this aspect of the test time, there is some ambiguity between the different uh, ambiguity in between the different um, the standards. And the European standards and the IEEE standard, but we can use this, the next approach. If we will do an, a commissioning test or an acceptance test, we are looking mainly for warmanship issues or manufacturer defects. There is no way we have wire trees in a new cable because remember, to have a wire tree, we need water in the insulation, electrical stress, that means that the cable be in service, and second, a lot of time, okay? So in a new cable, we are looking mainly for warmanship issues or manufacturing defects. And we will convert in faults that warmanship issues in manufacture and manufacturing defects by mean of electrical trees. So the electrical trees grow, the electrical tree grows very fast. For that reason, we don't need too much time. We can do a commissioning test at 30 minutes. But by the other hand, we are doing an, uh, a maintenance test uh, let's say in a cable that has been in service for 20 years, 
we have a risk that we have some wire trees in the cable. We know that the wire trees grow very slow in the cable. For that reason, we will need more time to convert and pull the wire trees. And for that reason, we need to extend the test time to 60 minutes. Okay, that's some of the approach that we can use regarding the test time for the VLF test. And as I said, the frequency is 0 0.1 hertz. Uh, as I said, also uh, in the case of the sinus uh, wave shape, uh, or in the case of the sinus VLF units, we have a limited um, uh, test capacitance at 0 0.1 hertz. So uh, almost all the sinus VLF units in the market allow to decrease the frequency because if we decrease the frequency, we can increase the test capacity. This is something that, that we can do, okay? And indeed, the IEEE 400.2 allow us to decrease the frequency to test a cable that is very, very long and exceed the test capacitance of my VLF sinus unit. But if we decrease the frequency, if we decrease the frequency during a VLF test, we need to keep in mind the next information. And this is a very interesting chart that, that shows us uh, uh, the growth rate of the defects of electrical trees versus uh, the test voltage. Uh, the test voltage, the do not, the, the do not test voltage RMS. And you can see that, for instance, if you will do a VLF test using a sinus wave shape and with the frequency of, at, of 0.1 hertz, the growth rate in millimeters per hours using three, applying a voltage of three times do not RMS will be 10 millimeters per hour, okay? Now, if we use uh, a cosine rectangular wave shape and the same frequency, 0.1 hertz, and we apply the same voltage, three times do not RMS, the growth rate of the electrical uh, threes during the VLF test will be exactly the same, 10 millimeters per hour. But what happens if we do a uh, VLF using a sinus wave shape, but we decrease the frequency to 0 0.01 hertz. What happens is that we the, the growth rate will decrease 10 times because you can see here that if I apply the same voltage three times, do not RMS, RMS, uh, the growth rate will decrease at one millimeter per hour, which means that if we decrease the frequency, we should extend the test time uh, because uh, other way we will not allow uh, to uh, we will not we will not allow to the electrical trees to uh, convert in port. Okay, other approach or other most uh, most easy approach to this is this the next one. If you do a VLF test, a, a, a VLF test during 30 minutes at 0.1 hertz. At 0 0.1 hertz, how many, how many cycles you will have in 30 minutes? 180 cycles in 30 minutes at 0 0.1 hertz. If you decrease the frequency to uh, 0 0.01 hertz in 30 minutes, you will have only 18 cycles, 10 cycles less, okay? So that is the reason because we need to keep in mind that if we increase the frequency, if we decrease the frequency, we should increase the test time of the uh, of the VLF test. So, in terms of the uh, voltages, we have the tables in the IEEE 400.2, and depending on the wave shape or the technology we are using, is the, the voltages we will apply. Only to show you the difference, for instance, for the acceptance test, uh, if you, we use a sinus wave shape in, and we are testing a 15 kV cable, uh, we will apply uh, 30 kV peak, which means 21 RMS kV peak. Yeah. And if we are uh, doing, uh, we are using a cosine rectangular wave shape, uh, then the uh, peak voltage and the RMS voltage are the same, okay? The only difference between, as you know, the only difference between the peak and the RMS voltage is with the sinus. And this is something important to keep in mind because in, for instance, the, some European standards only accept the RMS voltage, don't accept peak voltages. So 
if you try to do a BLF test with a sinus web shape and you apply uh, 30 kb peak, they will say it's not good enough because 30 kb peak is only 21 kb RMS. Okay, so it's something that we should keep in mind also. Uh, the goals of the DLF is, of course, improve the reliability of the system. We know that typically if a cable passes the DLF test and we provide the right voltages and the right uh, test times, uh, the cable should not fail in the next two or three years. Uh, for that reason, we say that if a, VLF, if, if a cable passes the DLF test, we are improving the reliability of the cable system. Also, the goals of the uh, DLF is, of course, uh, accelerate the existing weak spots to failure during a scheduled outage under controlled uh, test conditions and at reduced energy levels. It's not the same that we have a fault in a cable when the cable is in service, that we have a fault when the cable is on, under a VLF test. The big difference is the energy released. Okay, of course, when we have a fault in service, the energy released will be higher. That we that the energy released when we are doing a VLF test, and in that way, in that way, we can limit the collateral damage and the degradation of the insulation of the cable. Yeah? And finally, of course, one of the last goals of the VLF is to repair and replace on planet proactive basis, not on planet on, on or in reactive way. So. Uh, Finally, to talk uh, talking of the advantages and limitations of the VLF test, we can say the, that some of the advantages is that the VLF test is a simple withstand test, no expert required to operate or interpret the results. The VLF, uh, the VLF has no adverse effects on cable life at uh, prescribing levels. Is uh, let's say that is a non-destructive uh, test in, in from the point of view that will not create any additional problem. In, if the insulation is in good uh, in, in, in a good state, okay. Uh, and the VLF test is effective as a withstand test to detect low and high resisted local defects in the cable system, provided the proper test parameters are, are being used. And, and finally, we can use the VLF as a source for the TAN delta and the partial discharge diagnostics, okay. Uh, some of the limitations of the VLF test is that the only gross warmanship defects are likely to be detected on new cable systems. Uh, we will not convert in full small manufactured defects, small warmanship issues, okay? Only gross warmanship uh, defects will be converted in full during the VLF test. Uh, when testing cable system with extensive insulation degradation, Simple VLF withstand testing alone may uh, result in repeated failures. Although this is this is not uh, happens very often in practice, but it's something that we should consider. And the cable system will be taken out of service for testing. Of course, this is of course an, a disadvantage. And the VLF test will not provide information about the aging conditions of the insulation. Okay. So this is uh, some of the advantages and limitations of the uh, VLF test. The standards that apply for the uh, VLF test is, of course, the IEEE 400.2. We have also the German standard, the BDE 0276. We have the European standard and also the IEC standard 663. So some of the standards that we can use for the VLF test. Doing a brief summary of the VLF test, we can say that the VLF testing is the state of the art uh, cable test method. It's effectively is effective to be used by the construction crews as a substitute for DC hypertest test before switching a circuit in, 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 in uh, before the, uh, switching a circuit in, but will not tell us nothing about uh, the aging conditions of the insulation, will not tell us nothing about the high losses, wire trees, or how good or bad is the cable insulation. If we are looking for that kind of information, then we need to use the TAN Delta test, okay? And this is what we will discuss in the next, in the next slides. 
So the, mainly we use the Tan Delta to look or to investigate for the aging conditions of the insulation of the cable. Uh, the, the, the point is that we should not guess the age of our cables. And for that, we have the Tan Delta. So the Tan Delta is a global method of testing cables to monitor aging and deterioration of cable systems. And we know that there is a correlation between an increasing of the 0.1 Hz tangent delta, delta, the Tan Delta, and a decreasing insulation breakdown voltage level at power frequency. We know that we know uh, uh, that exists that correlation and is what we use to evaluate the aging conditions of the insulation of the cable. Uh, the Tan Delta is based on VLF technology, is a diagnostic tool, and of course is prescribed by the IEEE 400.2 2013. When to use the Tan Delta? Well, uh, we'll use the Tan Delta uh, typically on aged cables, at least cables that have been in service five or more years. And the goal is to detect the aging conditions in the insulation. We can use the Tan Delta as part of cable maintenance strategy to alert critical aged cables before in service fault and up to one or two years notice. And also, of course, we can use the Tan Delta as part of cable replacement project. Uh, what we can detect with the Tan Delta? Well, the Tan Delta we provide an overall condition assessment of the cable insulation will help us to target the worst cables. Uh, we can detect presence of wire trees in the insulation, contaminates in the insulation, insulation moisture, degraded accessories, and oil liquid in paper insulated uh, cables. And also we can assess effectiveness of repair. For instance, if we do a Tan Delta in a circuit and one of the phases has very high values of Tan Delta, then maybe we, we can cut the terminations of the cable and repeat the, the Tan Delta test and see if we have a better results, a better readings of the Tan Delta. If that is the case, the problem were the uh, terminations. If we have the same situation, that means that the cable is Age is a very old cable, and maybe we should think and replace that cable. Okay, so that is some of the way we can use the Tan Delta. What we cannot detect with the Tan Delta? Well, we cannot locate discrete problems, only that there is or is not a problem. Okay, for instance, once again, if we have a very high um, values of Tan Delta. It could be that the problem is wire trees in the insulation. It could be that the problem is the terminations of the cable, or it could be that we have a corroded concentric, okay? But by only doing the Tan Delta, we will not be able to know from where the problem comes, okay? Uh, we cannot detect problems in the jacket or the lead sheath of the cable. We cannot see for pro poor warmanship or manufacturing defects. So to understand um, how the Tan Delta works, we can use this very simplistic uh, uh, circuit that represents uh, a cable. So this uh, circuit represents a cable, and in this case, this circuit represents a cable, a cable with a perfect insulation. Okay, let's let's consider that that this circuit represents a cable with a perfect insulation. In this case. All the current that will circulate through this circuit, all the current that will circulate through my cable will be the resistive current, the current going through this resistor, plus the uh, current going through this capacitor, okay? But if I have a cable with a perfect insulation, the resistance of this resistor will trans to infinite, okay? We will have a very, very high value of resistance. And if I have a very, very high value of resistance, there is no way for the resistive current to go through the resistor. So all, this, all the current circulating in this uh, circuit will be the capacitive current, okay? Because the resistive current will, will be equal to zero. So if I do the phase diagram of this circuit, I will have that the voltage and the current I separated by an angle of 90 degrees and the resistive current is equal to zero. Uh, now, let's consider the next uh, situation, the next scenario in which I, do, I don't longer have a perfect insulation, 
okay so if i don't have a perfect insulation the value of the resistance no longer trends to infinite and i will i will start to see some resistive current go i will start to see some resistive current going through this resistor okay in that case this phase diagram no longer represents what is happening in this circuit right now and this phase diagram is what will represent what is happening right now in which I have a little component of the resistive current, okay? And this uh, angle, that is the delta angle, will be a good indicator of how good or how bad is the insulation of my cable. If this angle trends to zero, means that I don't have resistive current, and I have the a scenario in the uh, left, which I have a perfect or almost an intact insulation. But if this angle trends to 90 degrees, means that the resistive current is increasing, uh, and that means that I am losing insulation. So uh, the uh, trigonometric function that correlates the resistive current and the capacitive uh, current is the tan delta function. And you can see very clear from this equation what I said. If we have higher resistive current, I will have a higher tan delta, which means that I am losing insulation in my cable. If I have a, a very uh, small is, is the, uh, resistive current, if I have a very small resistive current, I will have a small tan delta, which means that I have a cable almost new or with uh, intact insulation. So to perform the 10 delta test, we need to use a sinus wave shape and we need to use the frequency of 0.1 Hertz. We will measure the 10 delta between eight to 10 times per voltage step and the three voltage steps that we will apply to do the 10 delta test will be, the first one will be 0.5 U naught. The second one will be 0.1 U0 and the third one will be 1.5 U0. Why we need to use a sinus wave shape? Well, the, the reason is because as we saw in the previous slides, we will use the phase diagram to see the correlation between the voltage and the current, okay? And we need the phase uh, reference between the peaks of the voltage and the peaks of the current. And that reference, we'll, we will not have that reference in a cosine rectangular wave shape, okay? For that reason, we cannot use the cosine rectangular wave shape to evaluate the tan delta. So the first evaluation criteria we, that we will use is the mean value of the tan delta, which means that we will add all the individual values of the tan delta for each one of the voltage steps we will add all the single, all the individual values of the tan delta, and we will divide that uh, uh, addition by the number of the measurements. In this case, 30, because we have 10, 10, and 10, 30. So we will add all the single values of the tan delta and will be divided by 30 in this case, okay? So this is the first uh, criteria that we, can, we need to use. The second one, is the delta of, of the tan delta, which means the delta of the tan delta is the mean value of the tan delta at 1.5 do not, uh, the mean value of the tan delta at 1.5 do not, and we will subtract the mean value of the tan delta at 0 0.5 do not. That is the sec second criteria to evaluate the tan delta. And the third, third one is the standard deviation of the time stability of the tan delta, which means how far or close among each other are the individual values of the tan delta for each voltage step. Uh, if, for instance, in the first voltage step, we have uh, a low standard deviation because the values of the tan delta are very close to each other. But in the second uh, voltage step, we, we see that the individual values are dispersed among each other. And it's the same case in the third and last voltage step. Okay, so this is the last uh, and the third uh, criteria that we will evaluate. Once we have evaluated the, uh, these three criteria, we can use the tables in the IEEE 400.2 to compare our results and see what is the condition assessment of our cable. 
uh, we can have different condition assessment depending on the values of the uh, VLF time stability, the uh, delta of the 10 delta at the mean value of the 10 delta. And depending on the value we got is the condition assessment. And we can have uh, no action required, further study advised, and action required. What means each one of the conditional assessment? Well, no action required means that no indication of severe problems in the short terms, the cable system can be returned to service and the cable system should be retested re at some uh, later date, maybe four years, okay? That means that the cable is, the, 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 the aging conditions of the cable are really not bad, it's a cable that has a good insulation. Uh, further study advice means that we need additional information to make an assessment. Maybe we can compare our results with the previous results of 10 delta in that cable. Uh, maybe we will need additional uh, measurement, for instance, a mon monitor uh, with stand test. Or maybe we need to do a visual analysis of the circuit component. For instance, maybe we need to see how are the termination of the splices in the cable, because we know that um, uh, the ingress of water uh, or wet termination, wet splices will increase the values of the time delta, okay? So further study advice, it need that we need to do more, uh, more measurements or to do visual analysis to see what is uh, the problem. And action required means that we have a poor insulation condition and the cable system should be considered for replacement or repair immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, what is very important to know or to keep in mind is that we never ever, when we are doing by the first time a 10 delta, we will make a decision. Especially we will not make a decision to replace a cable if we have a action required assessment criteria, okay? We always need to wait at least for two or three measurements to make a decision. But never ever when we are doing, never ever when we are doing by the first time a 10 delta test, we should not uh, uh, take or make an assessment uh, right away. Uh, besides the criteria or besides the assessment we saw in the previous slide, we have others that we can use. For instance, we know that there is a voltage dependency of the 10 delta versus, there is a voltage dependency of the 10 delta for the XLPE insulation and the paper insulated cables. We can see in the chart in the uh, left that for instance, for a reference cable or a new cable, or that is the, the red chart, or for a slightly service aged cable, that is the, the yellow chart, uh, there is no such dependency of the 10 delta versus the voltage. Almost we have a flat line. But for the blue uh, chart, that is for a strongly service aged cable, we can see that as we increase the voltage, the uh, loose the dissipation factor, the 10 delta increases. So there is a clear uh, dependency of the 10 delta uh, versus the voltage for a strongly service aged cable in the case of the XLPE insulation. And in the key, in the case of the paper insulated cables is pretty much the same. You can see in the chart in the right that for a well impregnated cable, we have almost a flat line, but for a poorly impregnated cable, we have the same dependency of the uh, loss factor versus uh, the voltage, okay? As we increase the voltage, uh, the loss factor increases. So, uh, how to interpret the results? Well, uh, as I said, is as many 10 delta measurements we have uh, regarding a cable will be easy to make a decision, okay? So, what we recommend is that after the fifth year of the cable, we'll start with the uh, 10 delta test. In that way, we will have a lot of measurements when uh, we need to make an assessment regarding the replacement of our cable. In this slide, we're seeing uh, what we consider a good cable. Uh, of course, there is some kind of dependency of the 10 delta versus the voltage, but it's not a big one. So we could consider that in this case, the three phases of this circuit are, are in, in good, are, are okay. They are not very old. So we can re return 
there's a circuit in service and, and maybe repeat the test in three or four years. The next slide shows how um, uh, the weather can affect the results of the 10 delta. The charts in the uh, left are uh, the results of the 10 delta of a good cable, but uh, during uh, the, the 10 delta measurement was made during a raining day. And you can see that we have a higher uh, 10 delta measurements, okay? In the right, we have the same circuit, but during a sunny day, the measurement was made during a sunny day, and we know uh, and we can see that the values of the 10 delta improve it. Okay, so the weather can affect the, the measurements of the 10 delta, and it's also something that we should consider. And in this, and finally, in this slide, we can see a really strange behavior of the phase L3. In the phase L3, you can see that. Um, uh, as we start to increase the voltage, uh, the values of that 10 delta decreases, okay? Which is a very strange behavior because when we expect the behavior that we expect of the 10 delta versus the voltage is that if the cable is very old, the 10 delta will increase its value. Or if the cable is okay, there will not be, there will not be change in the values of, of the 10 delta as we increase the voltage. But in, the, in this case, uh, the 10 delta decreases as we increase the voltage. And what happened is that uh, we have some um, uh, water, some uh, moisture in the cable. And as we apply voltage, uh, the current evaporates some of the water. And when we reach the, when we reach the 19 kV, uh, the water was evaporated and we start to see the normal behavior of the 10 delta. Okay, so this is some of the strange um, things that we can find in the in the in the field and that we need to keep in mind. And finally, this is something that happened uh, only a couple of weeks ago in a refinery here in Mexico. And uh, what happened is that it was a cable of 5 kb, an XLP cable, and the phase of one had a very different behavior than the phase L2 and L3 of the circuit, okay? So what to do in this kind, in this kind of situations? Well, what we recommend, or what, what, what we recommended to the customer is to cut the terminations. We don't have splices in this cable, so we recommended to the customer to cut uh, the terminations and repeat the 10 delta without the terminations and see if the behavior of the of the cable improves or is similar to the behavior of the phase L2 and L3. If that is the case, the problem was uh, the problem was the terminations, the problem were determinations. But if after they could the determinations and they repeat the test, we have the same behavior. So the problem comes from the cable. So maybe the customer should consider replace this cable in the next uh, future. So, uh, talking of the advantages of the 10 delta, we can say that it's a non-destructive uh, test. It's very unlikely to fold the cable during or after the test. But the measurement of the bulk properties of extruded insulation is an indicator of the severity of the wire tree. Uh, cable, system insulation, uh, cable system insulation condition can be graded among no action required, further study advised, or action required. And uh, the limitation is that the frequency must be 0 0.1 hertz. If other frequency that 0 0.1 hertz is used, we cannot use the tables in the A2 plea for 100.2. And remember, we have a limited length in the cables on the test. In, in their, in, in their test. Remember, for the sinus uh, units in the market, more or less we have one microfarad of test capacitance at 0 0.1 hertz. And if we consider that a cable has around 0.3 microfarads per kilometer of cable, that means that the maximum length we will be able to test at 0 0.1 hertz will be more or less three kilometers. Uh, other limitation is that must be a single tape of cable insulation. For instance, if I have a mix of paper insulated cable and XLP insulation cable, 
then as I have higher losses in the XLP insulation, that higher losses will mask some defects in the XLP insulation, okay? So there is other limitation of the tan delta. And with the exception of wet accessories, the tan delta cannot detect singular defect in extruded cable insulation. And finally, to finish this presentation, I would like uh, to discuss something regarding discuss about the use of the tan delta on new cable systems. Uh, there are some customers that use the tan delta on new cable systems to get a fingerprint of their cables or to detect contaminants in the insulation. If we do tan delta on new cables, it will be very important that we keep in mind the next uh, uh, points, the next information. The first one is that the figures of merit which means the tables, uh, the, the tables in the actual play for 100.2, which means the table four to table seven, should not be applied uh, to tandle to, to new cables uh, systems. Okay. In that case, if we are using the tandle on new cable systems, we need to use the tables in the annex G of the IEEE 400.2. This is one of the points that we should keep in mind. The second one is that there are some volatile elements in the cable insulation, essentially uh, cross-linked by products and additives that uh, will disappear slowly during the service, okay? And unfortunate, unfortunately, uh, because of this, the losses of the new XLP cables insulation can be even higher than those of service aged PE or XLP insulations. Eh? And the last one is that at the present, many cable manufacturers apply XLP copolymers uh, only to distinguish between homopolymer and copolymer. Let's say that an XLP homopolymer is a pure polyethylene and XLP copolymer is a blend between XLP uh, or polyethylene and other copolymer material, for instance, ethylene, butyl acrylate, or something like that. Okay, but the point is that at the present, many cable manufacturers use this um, XLP copolymer, and these copolymers change the, the electric responses. And to show this in a very uh, simple way, you can see the next chart. The, the next chart, and you can see that, for instance. For the XLP homopolymer, the behavior of the, uh, the electric losses is more or less what we expect. As the cable ages, uh, as the cable ages, we will increase the tan delta values. But for the XLP copolymer, you can see that even when the cable is new, we will have very high losses. And that loss will be higher even than when the cable is in service. So we will get some kind of confusion if we, we are not aware of this information, okay? And uh, uh, doing a brief summary of what we saw regarding tan delta, uh, we can say that well, the tan delta is for sure an scalar quantity, it's a dimensionless unit. Uh, we measure the angle, the, this means the ratio of the resistive to the capacitive current, and as the cable age, the insulation resistance decreases, the resistive current increases, and the angle increases. And of course, of course we can compare these um, results of this angle with the IEEE 400.2 2013. Uh, in MEGA, we have the both kind of uh, both type of technologies. We have the cosinus rectangular uh, VLF units, and we have the sinus VLF units. In the left we are seeing uh, some of the cosine rectangular units we have in MEGA. We have the 28 kV VLF, we have the 40 kV and the 60 kV, which cover the most uh, common medium voltage cables. And in the, in the right, we have the sinus units, we have the VLF sinus 34, the sinus 45 for uh, 15 and 25 kilovolt cables, and we have finally the VLF sinus 62 kV, that is for all the medium voltage cables from 5 kV up to 35 kV. Huh? And with this, uh, oh, I'm sorry, of course, we can provide all our units uh, work with uh, 
with the uh, software that can uh, uh, emit all the report with all the information that you needed to um, uh, evaluate the 10 delta and to make an assessment. Huh? And with this, this is uh, all what I have. Uh, Michael uh, is done. Over to me. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Javier. So at this time, we're coming to the end of our presentation portion of our webinar. Uh, we'll now take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now onto the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon our future webinars. On that survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any maker products. A copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view recordings of previous webinars as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.megger.com webinars and register for our next webinar on March 19th titled Advanced Testing and Assessment of Instrument Transformers. All right, let's jump into your questions. The first one I have, I'm going to direct to Charles Nybeck. Charles, is there a difference between TD results at 0.1 hertz and 60 hertz? Thanks, that's a good question, Michael. Um, yes, there is. So tan delta measurements are frequency dependent. Um, and essentially the polarization effects are, are much higher or greater at lower frequencies. Um, and essentially this leads to higher sensitivity. So what you typically see is, is tan delta results at a higher uh, value at your 0 0.1 hertz as opposed to uh, 60 hertz. So it just offers some higher sensitivity at that point. All right. Thank you, Charles. Uh, next up, I'm going to send a question over to Henning Ochen. Uh, Henning, are tan delta tests appropriate to diagnose cables after installation and startup? Well, I think um, um, Javier uh, uh, spoke about the the main reason to do tan delta tests. Tan delta is a dielectric is a test of dielectric properties, and dielectric properties do change with the aging of the insulation material. So really, tan delta is appropriate to find out about the aging condition of cables uh, of the insulation. And in that regard, it's really uh, of very little use to do it on new cables because new cables don't have the aging of the insulation material. And I think in addition, what could make things worse was one thing that uh, Javier also mentioned, is the fact that uh, new cables have still carry some byproducts from the extrusion process. And these uh, 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 say, uh, byproducts are typically have fairly high dielectric losses. So it could mask a good tender from a cable on a brand new cable and make it appear higher. And that's what you many times see when you do on a new cable, you will see is still a flat curve between the three voltage levels, but it's parallel shifted to a higher absolute value. And that shows you that really the benefit of doing on a new table is, is uh, of very limited value or of no value, basically. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Henning, I have another question for you while I have you. Uh, damage from water tree is produced once water goes through the external insulation? Well, <clears throat> uh, water trees uh, is, is not to be looked at as, uh, you know, water rushing through the insulation. Water trees are basically is a breakdown of the crystalline structure within the polymer material. And uh, it, it, this happens as an effect of of moisture and voltage, AC voltage. That's what creates water trees. And you can have water trees, uh, they always will start at the highest uh, electrical field in a cable. And the highest electrical field you find in a cable at the, uh, at the, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, at the, uh, uh, 
difference between the the uh, uh, conduct semiconductive material and the insulation. There you have the biggest the biggest stress level. So you have two of those. You have one semicon layer around the conductor, and you have one semiconductor layer around the insulation. Because the one at the conductor is much closer to the conductor, the electrical field is higher. So you can create water trees either from at the conductor that go, go to the outside. And that happens, for instance, if you have water between the strands, then you can grow water trees from the conductor towards the field. Or the other way around, if you have a, a compromised uh, jacket and you get water water uh, uh, seeping cheap, in to the cable, then you get water trees growing from the outside in towards the conductor. So, uh, <clears throat> there's a third type of, of water tree, and that is basically one that is within the insulation. It's called the bow tie tree, but that only happens when you have some sort of foreign object in the insulation material, and it creates similar structures like the water trees. But the typical water tree grows from the inside out or from the outside in. Thank you, Henning. Uh, back over to Charles. Charles, when you say PD, is it with VLF voltage or a full frequency voltage? So um, partial discharge testing can be done at both power frequency and uh, very low frequency. Um, so now whenever Javier was talking about it here in his presentation, uh, most of this or all of this pertains to very low frequency. Um, but that being said, partial discharge testing um, can still be done at, at both power and very low frequency. Now, there's going to be differences because um, obviously the at power frequency, you're um, you're cycling at five to six or five to six hundred times faster um, and have have more power at that at that same uh, voltage level. So um, as Javier mentioned, similar with uh, VLF test, if you perform the VLF test at a lower frequency, the 0 0.01 hertz instead of 0 0.1, um, then the test needs to take longer. Or you need to, to perform the test at a, for a longer duration. Um, and that would be the same here. Um, you, the difference would be if you were to perform the test at a uh, very low frequency, you would just perform the test over a longer period of time. Um, that being said, the characteristics are different between those two frequencies. So just kind of want to state, though you can perform the test at, v at VLF or power frequency, uh, you shouldn't compare those results. You should uh, stay consistent with the method of testing. So if you have tested, a, if you have historical data or have tested a cable uh, with VLF uh, for PD, then I would stick to that method. So that way you can correlate your data with historical um, values now uh, and the same with power frequency because they're they're not really um, comparable uh, due to the the different um, ways that they induce PD so um, if I could just Thanks, make sure. a comment on that really quick there is a way to replicate power frequency with a VLF test set um, but when you do that you're no longer using a sinus wave shape. So just, you know, that um, it is possible to replicate power frequency with a VLF that can either do DAC or uh, cosine rectangular outputs. Uh, no, thank you, Marshall, absolutely. Um, Javier kind of showed the cosine rectangular wave shape here for VLF. Um, and uh, as to Marshall's point, um, you can perform the VLF with the fundamental 0.1 Hertz um, and what that cosine rectangular does is during the polarity reversal allows for the the simulation or um, of power frequency, which is um, partial discharge is dependent on your change in voltage with change in time. So that polarity reversal mimicking the uh, power frequency um, allows you to perform the partial discharge test with the very low frequency um, uh, VLF test at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as um, Marshall also said you can use damped AC technology, which allows you to charge the cable 
um, and then discharge it uh, with a frequency depending upon the capacitance and inductance of the circuit. Um, and that also uh, mimics the power frequency. So those are two methods that you can use um, that imitate uh, power frequency PD testing. So thanks, Marshall, for that um, addition. Yes, thank you. Uh, next question is going to be directed over to Henning. Henning, why are water trees more prevalent in XLPE cables? Uh, that statement is probably uh, uh, generated based uh, on a comparison between maybe XLP and paper cables. Uh, paper cables, by the way, don't have any any water trees per se. Water trees are a uh, really uh, uh, typical effect on on polymer on solid dielectric cables or on polymer cables. So you have uh, water trees in XLP cables. You have water trees in the old uh, 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 polyethylene cables. You have water trees also in EPR cables. Now, why do you have more water trees? It looks like you have more cables with water trees in the XLP is because worldwide you have many more XRP cables than EPR cables. So that's why all the work on in IEEE 400.2, all the 10 delta experience is based on XRP cables and very little. There's one paragraph in and there's also a table for values giving what's called uh, a, a, a field cables. And field cables are EPR cables. And uh, so there are some values given, but keep in mind, EPR cables are unlike XRP cables, uh, depending on manufacturers, there are different com compounds. XRP is for every XRP cable, is the, the compound is the same. So you can characterize that material very well. The EPR material depends on the manufacturer and cannot be characterized uh, as uh, generally. And in that regard, it also has different dielectric properties, and that's why it's much harder to come up with good numbers for for EPR cables. So that's that's uh, I think maybe answers your the question. Okay. Uh, back over to Javier. Javier, what are the differences between sinus VLF and cosine VLF in terms of results? Well, I think that maybe uh, one of the big differences is that um, when we are doing a VLF test, uh, we try to convert in fault uh, uh, the big the big issues, and and we try to convert in in, in electrical trees that big is, that big issues. And in the reversal of the polarity, uh, the transition uh, uh, of the reversal of the polarity for the sinus wave shape will happens in terms of five. Uh, will be will we happen in five seconds okay by the other hand with the cosine rectangular or uh, will be in, in in milliseconds okay so we will have more stress we or we will we will stress more with a vlf cosine rectangular wave shape than with a vlf sinus wave shape okay for that reason in terms of the stress or in terms of re or replicate what we what happened with the cable when is working at 60 hertz is sometimes better the cosine rectangular wave shape. All right, thanks, Javier. Back over to Henning. Henning, when performing tan delta testing, it is my understanding that all other conductors and their shields are to be grounded, and the VLF test lead attached to the, to the conductor to be tested. However, a colleague has indicated that all other conductors and shields shall not be grounded when performing tan delta testing. Could you please clarify this? Well, I think the question is much more general than uh, just uh, be applicable to tan delta testing. Any type of high voltage testing, the basic rule is a very simple one. Uh, you, you make a connection to the test object and that's a hot connection because that's where you your high voltage will be carried on, and everything else in that in what's in that test circuit should be bonded to ground. Okay, so that's why the um, the other phases. If you test the three phase system and you test ten delta on one phase, the other two phases should be grounded 
So it should be also there neutral, should be also everything should be grounded. That is the only safe way you can do it. Otherwise, you want a chance that if you have ungrounded conductors, that you build up static potentials that can even flash over because you have potential differences then that can flash over. By tying everything to ground, you establish very well defined potential, uh, 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 you know, the, the electrical uh, field, and you establish the potentials between high voltage and ground. Thank you, Henry. Uh, over to Marshall. Marshall, what are the minimum testing conditions for the tan delta testing? Uh, tan delta testing as far as temperature and rel oh, relative humidity. I couldn't read for a moment. I'm sorry. Well, let me answer this question in a couple of different ways. Um, as was shown in uh, Javier's presentation, he gave an example where the same circuit was tested when it was rainy and when it was not rainy. And so um, in simplistic terms, if the uh, if it's raining or the humidity is very high, at your terminations, in essence, you can you can have uh, you know I use the term leakage current. This is not technically correct, but basically you're having uh, you're increasing your tan delta measurement <clears throat> because of the humidity at the uh, end. Now, what the actual humidity uh, should be that off the top of my head i don't know and henning might know i don't know if that's called out in the standard but think about it this way if i'm trending tan delta data like you know let's say every year i come out and retest a critical cable in that sense what's probably most important is that the relative humidity be uh, the same it, it shouldn't vary wildly you shouldn't test uh, on a rainy day one year and the next uh, year it's a sunny day. So if you're trending, the absolute relative humidity might not be quite as important within reason as if it's the same. The same thing if you're if you're testing multiple circuits on the same day and you're comparing multiple circuits to each other, um, then in essence, they're all being tested at the same relative humidity and temperature. So it's a little bit less important, um, but that's it. And there's a third way to think about it. If you're comparing your results to the IEEE standards, that's that's your reference point, and your cable passes, then in a, in a way, what you can say is, well, whatever the relative humidity was, it 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 didn't keep me from passing the cable. And if the cable was bad, it wouldn't have, in other words, the relative humidity can't improve the result, it could only degrade the result. So there's a couple of different ways to think about. But at the end of the day, you don't do this testing on a rainy day. Maybe just add a little bit of a, of a comment on this. It's the humidity should be the same, or pretty much the same. But also the temperature should be the same because obviously humidity changes also with temperature. So if you can, if you do the trending test like Marshall is saying, and you make sure that when you compare these data, they were taking at approximately the same humidity and same ambient temperature, then I think it's a, it's, it's a good way of doing it, the best way of doing it. Thanks guys. Uh, moving on, Henny. Most literature I've read on tan delta testing focuses on XLPE insulation. Are there any special considerations for tan delta testing of service aged EPR cables? Uh, well, uh, it goes back to a little bit of the question we answered before. Uh, there is a section in the IEEE standard that talks about uh, tan delta testing on EPR cables. It's not called EPR, there. it's called on filled solid dielectric cables which is EPR because it's basically the copolymer that you put some um, <clears throat> other typically and inorganic ingredients in to fill it, uh, which, uh, you know, changes its properties and um, uh, changes its properties on the one side, makes it a little bit more flexible than XRP cable, uh, which why people like it. Um, 
but it also increases the losses in the cable. And that's why, you know, except EPR cables are typically not used in, in Europe at all. Um, but uh, but uh, there, there is no, uh, no special considerations. It's just that there is very little uh, data, consistent data available to really to really uh, uh, bring up tables like we see for the XLP tables. That is the only the only reasons. If we had more data, I, I'm sure there would be there would be published in IEEE as well. Thank you, Henning. Uh, over to Marshall. For tan delta measurements, you have indicated eight to ten measurements per step. Is there also a rule of thumb for time for each step, i.e., three minutes per step? Um, no, the the time per step is dependent on a couple of things. Um, primarily, the number of measurements you make. In other words, if you took eight measurements of tan delta, it would take less time than taking ten. Um, so the other the other factors involved is how long does it take your test set to, to charge the cable to whatever the voltage level is, and then and then record the tan delta. So I, I'm just making this up, but let's say it takes 10 seconds to charge this particular cable up and take a measurement. And if you do it eight times, that means it's gonna take 80 seconds for that step. But if you did it 10 times, it would take 100 uh, seconds. So you know, different test sets, different length cables, different voltage levels might vary the overall duration slightly, you know, in terms of, you know, how long does one individual step take to reach the voltage level and then to record that measurement. But it's not something that you, you don't set the time. The time is a result of the cable you're testing and the number of measurements per step. And, and, and maybe just as a as a general remark on it, typically the test time for 10 delta is way less than it takes to get the cable ready to test. So it's typically a very very small fraction of the of the overall test time that you need. So it's not very significant. Yeah, the, the 10 delta is a is a relatively short test, which is one of the nice things from a field operation point of view. You turn it on and it goes through those steps fairly quickly. All right, up to our next question is Javier. Uh, Javier, in slide 42, you show the tan delta result of a wet cable in phase three. You've mentioned that the water vaporized at 19 kV. If you were to conduct the tan delta test again shortly after, would it show a similar result? Well, in that, in that specific case, very probably, uh, we will start with a normal behavior, okay? If we have repeated the test, we will start in, the, in that phase with a normal behavior because all the water was vaporized in the previous in the previous tan delta test, okay? So very probably, if we uh, conduct the tan delta again, uh, maybe we will not have that strange behavior. All right, thanks, Javier. Over to Marshall. Marshall, if you perform the test for 60 minutes, but the electrical tree has not been fully established, say 90%, then is it possible that it will fail when it goes back into service? So this question has a, a lot of implications. The short answer is, yeah, that's exactly what could happen. However, if you use the correct voltage level and the 60 minute duration, um, this gets back to uh, how long it takes for a water tree to grow under different, you know, uh, different frequencies and voltages. If you follow the standard, this should not happen. Um, but if you were testing at a reduced voltage, um, in, es in essence, you've, you've slowed down the growth of this damaged area, this could happen. Um, but it shouldn't. But, but what it brings up is there's a reason that on aged cable you test for 60 minutes because you can flip this around and you could say um, we, we test for 30 minutes 
and we grew the fault to 90% and then we quit. And then, you know, three weeks later, two months later, that cable fails under service. To avoid that problem, you need to use the correct test voltage and the correct duration. I mean, this is exactly why the first version of the IEEE standard that was published in 2005, it called out for 30 minutes test. And when you look at at uh, actually 15 to 30 minutes. If you look at the 20, what is it now? 13 version, it calls out at least 30, but preferred 60 minutes. That is exactly the reason because many people would would follow along the old 15 minute test used from the DC hyper test and exactly what you described would happen. They started the electric tree, but didn't bring it to fruition. So they would have a failure afterwards in the field. That's why, you know, like Marshall was saying, especially for service age failures, the 60 minute is very important and there are data available. And for long, for long time, it shows it makes no sense to test any longer than 60 minutes if you do the right voltage level. If you use that right voltage level, then there is a, a, a no, no, statistical probability to have failures after that 60 minutes. And if I could jump in and just make one more comment, because this is kind of a, for VLF testing, this is a big deal. And, and that is um, many people are concerned about causing damage with a VLF. If you use the right voltage level, it will not cause damage. In other words, if there's not some type of void or a flaw or beginning or water tree that has reached a certain stress level, it, there's nothing to grow. It, it only grows um, defects, if you will, that are already there. It doesn't create them. Now, if the defect is there, you do want to weed it out. You want it to show up. You want, that's how you increase your reliability by eliminating that defect. In other words, if you have a defect and you find it with the VLF test, you just saved yourself an outage. Well, there's actually data available that shows that very nicely what Marshall was talking about. Um, if you look at 60 hertz testing and you see between a, a very good cable and a, let's say, a, a poor cable, the difference in breakdown voltage is, is very small. It's not a whole lot. So basically, uh, you could have a chance that you break down a good cable even if it doesn't have a defect. Where for the for the 0.1 hertz, that difference is much, much bigger. It's about five times as big. So chances, if you have a good piece of cable to damage it, so to speak, by the VLF test, is much smaller when you use VLF test than compared when you use AC power frequency. And that data is available. Uh, it was created in sometimes in the 90s, and there is a chart for it that can be published. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, our next question is going over to Henning. Could we do a tan delta test on insulated bus switch gear to validate the epoxy insulation? Well, uh, principally, you, you, you can do a tan delta test on anything uh, that is insulation because you're testing the losses of the insulation, whatever the losses are created by, okay? The problem with this one is uh, you would need uh, enough data on epoxy insulated bus bar to know what it means. You might get data, but you don't know what it means, and then the test becomes irrelevant, okay? Also, when you have, when you do this type of testing, and in this case, it's bus bar, uh, if you have this attached to any other device, or I always use the, 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 the uh, example of an oil switch. Now, you wouldn't have this attached to an oil switch, I know, but I just want to get the point across. If you had this epoxy box bus bar attached to an oil switch that is open, and you would do a 10 delta test, you still would test also the dielectric losses of the oil, right? So the problem is you have to isolate it first, but then you also have to know what it means for the insulation that you specifically are testing. Then 
you could you could do that. Uh, but to my knowledge, there is nothing nothing in the literature that that would describe this type of testing on on a proxy insulated bus bar for ten delta testing. So. All right. Our next question is over to Marshall. Uh, Marshall, can this test be used for fault locating tests, and how accurate are those tests? Um, <clears throat> no, it cannot be used for fault location. Um, you know, the the VLF is a withstand test, and um, so that means the cable is not faulted. However, the reason this question is asked is is because if if it does not pass the withstand, then you do have you now have a fault, and um, and now you have to fault locate. So this is why if you're doing a VLF test, you need to be prepared with the right equipment on hand for fault location. If you don't, you're running the risk of, you know, not being able to sort of finish the finish things off because you don't have the right equipment with you. But the VLF test itself is not used for fault. Location. It has no capability of giving you a uh, a location or a distance to the failure point. Um, so, uh, but again, a lot of people miss this point. It's a good question. Is if you have a if you have a VLF test set, uh, you should either be prepared to you know set that cable aside if it doesn't pass, or be prepared to fault locate it with the right equipment on hand. All right, uh, and I think we have time for one last question, and that's going to go to Henning. Uh, Henning, regarding tan delta. If we talk about cable vans as sources for VLF, the length of test cable line could be longer than three kilometers. Three kilometers is a limitation for portable devices, isn't it? Uh, that is not uh, totally correct. Three kilometers, the, the, the length of the cable I can test is purely a function of the cable capacitance. So uh, if you look, for instance, at a cable, at a 15 kV cable, that is a, a number two cable. Uh, it might have a, uh, a capacitance of maybe one tenth of a micro per, per kilometer. So you have, you know, maybe 1.16 uh, micro per, per mile. Okay. When you go to a thousand MCM 15 kV cable, it might have a cable capacitance of 0.3 per kilometer or uh, in miles would be, you know, uh, one and a half uh, times, so it would be 0.45 microfarad per kilometer. So it, it all depends how long your cable is. Uh, you know, this is uh, one of the issues on wind farms where you have very long cables, where you have maybe five miles of cable, where you can have cable capacity of maybe three, four, or five microfarad. You need a machine that can can uh, generate enough energy to charge this cable up, okay? And whether this is it mounted in a truck or is a a portable or whatever you call it, it doesn't matter. The truck mount units don't have, or the test vans you talk about test vans don't have a larger power supply for the VLF function built in. Uh, than the equipment that you can buy anyways, okay? So this has nothing to do with it. And that's why we always, when we when a customer wants to buy VLF equipment, uh, the best way to assess this is to see what is the maximum cable capacitance you want to test. And, uh, and maybe what is 90% of your cable inventory, because sometimes it doesn't make sense to spend the extra money for to get 100 percent when 90 percent require a much smaller test set that is really there is no no length uh, limitation on any of these tests that is purely a capacitance test uh, capacitance limitation and that depends on the application all right thanks a lot henning so it looks like uh, that's all the time we have for our Q&A session today. Uh, I apologize if we didn't get to your question live, but we will be working to follow up with you offline. Uh, as a reminder, a copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. 
I'd like to thank you all for attending today. If you could please remember to answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a great week.